This is the AME exclusive. I'm Avalyn Sanders. On day two of the 50th quadrennial session of our general conference, celebrating our bicentennial, I had the amazing opportunity to speak with four of our bishops. These four bishops hold distinct places in our church's history. Bishop John Bryant, our senior bishop. Bishop John White, the new president of our bishop's council. Bishop Wilfred Messiah, who was elected the first bishop bridging the gap between the historic election of Bishop Harold Sinatli and Bishop Vashti Murphy McKenzie, the first woman elected to our Episcopal See. They shared some wonderful insights on what it means to be AME and their reflections on this bicentennial celebration. Plus, they share some things you cannot find on the internet or in a book. And that is why this is the AME exclusive. You can only get it here. Enjoy. I am delighted to be with Bishop John Bryant, our senior bishop of the AME Church. Thank you, Bishop Bryant, for speaking with us um, this afternoon. Um, let's do that again so I can catch this. Because I want to get you. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to have to move this over to you to catch you. Okay. Mr. Rolly David. This is the AME exclusive. I'm Alvalyn Sanders, and our coverage continues. I'm speaking now with Bishop John Bryant, the senior bishop of the AME Church. Thank you, Bishop Bryant, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you for having me. I understand that you are on your way out to join a march that's going to be in progress this afternoon. Um, can you share something about that and share it with us in the context of the AME Church, why it's important for you as our senior bishop to join the march that's going to take place? Uh, well, I think it's extremely ap appropriate. Um, the African Methodist Episcopal Church really started uh, not out of a theological conflict, but a sociological. Uh, we are a church that has been birthed out of uh, the womb uh, that requires liberation and justice. And so it is in keeping that uh, in our 200th year of existence as a denomination that we be found doing what we have always done as a church. And the march is going to be in um, awareness or protest or recognition of the recent killings of unarmed African Americans in this country, particularly the two uh, this past week, Philando Castile and um, Sterling, Alton, Alton Sterling, yes. Yes, uh, in America, every 28 hours, uh, a black man is killed by police in this country. Uh, and so we've seen that lived out uh, in Minnesota and in Baton Rouge, Louisiana within a 24-hour period. Uh, two uh, persons who were unarmed uh, were, were murdered. And uh, it is getting to the place where you, you wonder uh, what's happening when the country can see it, they can see the atrocities and live in living color. And still, um, uh, uh, the court system will find uh, the police um, uh, innocent. Uh, but a black life, another black life, is, has been wiped out. Uh, and here we have it again. In both instances, it was uh, videotaped. Uh, I believe that uh, in in Minnesota, no, in Baton Rouge, both police said that their body cameras uh, malfunctioned or fell off. It's, that's amazing to me, quite a coincidence. Uh, but still, other footage was uh, acquired, and you can see it. But what usually happens in these incidents is immediately the black victim goes on trial. Immediately the black victim's background is researched. Uh, in, in, when it is in, in a white context, in a white person, uh, 
that's, that doesn't take place. They are victims. But as far as black, when you, when you live in this skin, uh, you, you do not ever have the, the status of being a victim. Uh, immediately they look through, comb through uh, your, your past and anything at all that will give them an excuse to release the police. And it's, it's getting to the point that as a community, uh, we as a people, both black and brown, and um, justice-seeking whites are saying, this is too much, and when will it end? Uh, so we have to march, and we have to vote, we have to protest, uh, we have to keep this issue before the country, because if you say nothing, it will absolutely continue and escalate. At the unveiling of the statue, he said, we're going to celebrate this week. This is our 200th birthday. We're going to celebrate. Um, even with all that's happened in the, in the news and, and happening every day in the world, we're going to celebrate. Talk about what this bicentennial has meant for you, especially since this is your, your last general conference as an active, I'm going to say quote unquote, <laughs> active bishop. Uh, for me, it's just a fantastic time to be alive. Uh, it, it makes us uh, remember our ancestors and what they went through. Uh, to think about that we are part of a people uh, that, that had vision, that life would be better. They risked everything to make their lives better. They dreamed, they envisioned. Then they rolled up their sleeves and went to work. And here we are 200 years later, and the vision has concretized, and we've been able to see it. Uh, a church that started in a corner of Philadelphia on 6th and Lombard Street, uh, but now exists on four continents. Uh, it, it is just uh, magnificent to be a part of it. And the history that is a part of this church uh, is just fantastic. Uh, so it is a source of great pride and, and um, a great sense uh, of celebration for us as a people. Just for a moment, a personal reflection. There have been a few bishops I have heard who have mentioned sermons that have transformed their lives. Uh, I have my own Bishop Bryant story that maybe I'll tell you one day of a sermon that transformed my life. But I'd like to know, kind of pausing for the, you know. I'd like to know, how does it make you feel when you hear stories, especially from bishops and even uh, ministers like myself, that you delivered a sermon that that message was transformative for them? Well, it, it really affirms what the Bible says, the power of the gospel and the power of the uh, preached word. Uh, uh, at one uh, place, you talk about the foolishness of preaching, um, uh, but preaching is uh, bringing God into the human condition, and he's transformative, and so that when people walk up and say, you got it right, uh, what I say to myself is, God, God did it. And uh, it reaffirms that I have not wasted my living, but in following the Word of God and trying to be true to the Word of God, uh, there are witnesses who declare that the Word, that the word works. An extraordinary history and incredible future. What would you like to see happen in the future of the AME Church? Uh, I think even in this season, God has decided to uh, make our church a global uh, body, a global organism. Uh, so as I see the church uh, moving into its future, uh, it, is, it is no longer an African-American entity uh, that is for African Americans in North America. It's, it's a global church. Uh, our newest addition is uh, when we expanded into Asia and we now have 160 churches. 
uh, and uh, uh, this past year we had those in Brazil who are interested in coming into the AME Church, uh, those in Nepal who uh, have already begun to come into the church. So I see our church becoming more global, uh, not ever forgetting our roots, uh, our roots, our foundation, but on it is a building that will bring to reality the vision that God had, uh, and that is for the nations. Amen. Not for particular people, but, but, but the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. And I'm looking at the time when the AME Church will be there. Uh, I am not ever envisioning a time when we will not have a struggle. I am hoping that we can overcome racism uh, in this part of the world. Uh, but, but the needs of those who are in bondage, those who are in poverty, those who are locked out and left out, uh, wherever they are in the world, in the church, must be the hands and the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring liberation and empowerment. Last question, just for a bit of fun. I'm calling this the AME Vault question. Um, can you go back into your, your AME Vault and think of an AME memory either from your childhood or early pastoral days or early days as a bishop that may be something uh, that may cause you, bring you to smile and say, oh my goodness, how did I ever get past that? <laughs> uh, well, uh, one experience, I was in West Africa and uh, there was an opportunity there to expand the church into a particular village and uh, those who were indigenous to the area had this chief who wanted to join the church. Uh, but I could tell that uh, he had not been exposed to the Bible that much or to Christian theology, uh, but uh, uh, they asked me just to examine him, and so I asked him, I, I asked him if he could name three books of the Bible for me, and he said yes, and I said, uh, he, he said, uh, uh, David, I said, no, that's, that's not a book of uh, the Bible. He said, Kings. I said, yes, that's a book of the Bible. He said, oh, I know, Queens. <laughs> so that for me was almost as funny as Trump saying two Corinthians. So uh, I got quite a laugh out of it. Thank you, sir, kindly for your time. Thank you for your service to humanity. Uh, thank you for your service to God and God's people. Thank you for serving the AME Church um, in such a magnificent and tremendous way. Um, an honor to have this time with you, and thank you for speaking with us. And just thank you to you and your family for all that you've done for people across this world and for the AME Church, the Church of Richard Allen. And may God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the AME exclusive, and you can definitely only get this here. Bishop Bryant, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> the a and exclusive continues. I'm Alvin and Sanders here with Bishop John White. Bishop White, thank you for joining us and being a part of this, um, this series of interviews that we're doing for the AME Bicentennial. Thank you for having me. First, congratulations on being the new president of Bishop's Council and having the medallion passed on to you by Bishop McAllister. How did you feel yesterday when that was taking place? Very overwhelming. And to know that at this stage in, in my life and as well as in the life of the church, uh, 200 years in the bicentennial of the General Conference, it's amazing, it's a golden opportunity, and I'm just grateful to God for the opportunity that he's given me to serve the African Methodist Episcopal Church. When you knew your time was coming forward to have the medallion passed on to you, um, did it click in your mind that, hey, this is going to happen during the bicentennial, this might be an extra weight that I have to carry, maybe than some other bishops may have had to previously? Well, I would agree, but uh, I knew that my term was supposed to have been later. 
but I just believe the Lord moves in mysterious ways and whatever he decides to do, I'm amenable to what the Lord has for me and I guess it's my time and I accept it as an opportunity to expand the kingdom, to develop and to grow, to celebrate our bicentennial and to believe that our future is greater than our past. Considering the state of the country, state of the world, um, you are taking the helm of the Bishop's Council at um, somewhat of a tumultuous time in, in America, and, and I would say um, in the world seems to be more heightened. So um, these past um, several days, this, weeks this summer of 2016, um, how does that weigh into some of your leadership decisions that you would like to make in terms of how you would maybe steer um, the AME Church or the Bishop's Council? Well, historically, we have been an institution that's been social minded and social conscious. I don't think that our celebration does not relieve, of us, relieve us of the opportunity that we still must be the voice for the voiceless. We still must be the, the voice of the, the Christian community to raise the conscious level of the kind of things that's happening to communities and particularly to Afro-American men. We have a serious crisis in America. I believe it's the church's responsibility to rise to the occasion, address the issues, and to help us lift the conscious awareness of the fact that we cannot, can no longer continue to destroy young black males. We have a serious crisis in this country. And maybe it's providential that we as a denomination celebrate 200 years out of segregation. We've become a great institution in the life not only of the United States, but in around the world. I believe it's our time to raise the conscious level of all the Christians around the world and to say to them, America needs to mend its ways and care for all of its people. You are presently serving now on the continent of Africa. Can you share um, with our audience what is the AME Church like in the motherland? What's the regard for Richard Allen there? Can you share that with us? Very much so. We have a phenomenal opportunity in Africa to grow, to expand, and to develop. My concern is that we can no longer be an American church in an African context but we've got to be an African Methodist Episcopal Church in an African context. And to realize that they bring a tremendous amount of wealth, knowledge, opportunities. And I believe that if we can seize the moment, the AME Church has its better days and growth on the continent of Africa. And when you say seize the moment, what are some things that maybe, what can a local church, uh, let's say in Arkansas or Tennessee or Las Vegas, how can, how can those churches seize that moment? Well, I think the moment for them is to be partners with congregations in Africa. Some of our people live in villages, have no transportation, but they find a way to meet and to worship in an AME church on a Sunday morning. Walk five and six hours to get to church. I think we have an opportunity. Some of their facilities are dilapidated. Some of them are, 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 are brick and mortar that's cracking. I think if we can partner with them and, and, and be able to adopt one congregation and help them to grow and develop, they can have a marvelous opportunity. The worship experience is alive. The word is preached. We, matter of fact, we have in the 18th district, let me be more specific, we have more students in secondary schools in the 18th district than you got in colleges and universities in the United States under AME schools. Our opportunities are great. We need to seize the moment and develop an educational enterprise. Primary and secondary schools is what's needed. We have that opportunity to do that. I am quite enlightened. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, a couple more questions um, before we close. Um, you're here with your family. Um, what type of memories, new memories, have you cr been creating at this particular general conference, this is the bicentennial, that you'd like to share? Any uh, precious new memories that have come forth for you in the few days you've been here so far, in addition to being the new president of the Bishop's Council? Well, I, I, I'm very much excited about the Richard Allen statue. I participated in the, in the torch run. 
I think the world will know that we have a great heritage, a great history, and we need to tell our story in a positive kind of way. <laughs> Last question, I'm calling this the AME Vaults. Um, to go back into your AME vault and think of a memory that makes you smile either from your childhood in the AME church or your early days as a pastor or your early days as a bishop or even, you know, three weeks ago, but something, some memory that comes to mind that, that makes you smile or laugh. Well, what makes me smile? I remember 1956, my grandmother came from the Denneke Auditorium from the General Conference and had a button, Florida won't Gibbs. And I have never forgotten that. And here I am today, a bishop in the AME Church. My father was not a pastor nor a preacher. I'm delighted, I'm overwhelmed what God has done. And to bring me to this point in my life, to be a contributor to the future of a great institution, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Amen. Thank you, Bishop White, for your time. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you kindly. This is the AME exclusive, and you can only get it here. Bishop White. Thank you. Thank you. This is the AME exclusive. I'm Alvalyn Sanders, and we are with Bishop Wilford Jacobus Messiah from the 17th Episcopal District. Bishop Messiah, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. I'm glad to be here and have an opportunity to uh, speak on this bicentennial celebration of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, because I'm a very proud AME, uh, born and bred in a AME parsonage, and so uh, I'm happy to serve at this important time in the life and history of the church as one of its spiritual leaders. What have you thought about our bicentennial celebration so far? What's, what's spoken to your heart the most since you've been here? The celebration was just incredible. I remember growing up in uh, South Africa, apartheid South Africa, many years ago where my late father served as a pastor and later on as presiding elder. And when he talked about the church, this uh, liberating church, for, for it, it resonated with oppressed people. And so in the midst of our struggle, we were actually drawn as young people to this church. And it was a real uh, exciting period to be in Philadelphia where this church started, founded by a former African slave. Uh, I, I, I really don't have the words to describe it, but the day when, when we unveiled the statue and, and when we unveiled uh, the mural at the headquarters of the First Episcopal District, I was almost in tears uh, because being part of this liberating and reconciling church became a true reality for me who grew up as an oppressed person in apartheid South Africa. Share um, the memories you have of the role the AME Church played um, during apartheid in South Africa and any, and how it was a part of the dismantling of apartheid in South Africa. I left at, at the point where the struggle became very difficult. But as we always say, when the crisis at its, as, is at its highest, victory is right around the corner. Uh, so I came in 79. Uh, and when I got here, I think what opened the eyes of the world was a special uh, that was on Nightline at the time. But the AME Church played a critical role because in the AME Church, 
we had the opportunity to mix races when the government really did not allow that to happen, but bishops like Bishop James, Bishop Ming, uh, and at that critical time, Bishop Young was the bishop there, and I remember how Bishop Young used to support the libera liberation fighters, how he, he printed up uh, printing work for the ANC, how during the beginning of election he shared with black people throughout that country to raise the awareness of what the struggle is all about. So the AME Church prayed the critical. In fact, in the struggle, meetings were held in AME churches. It is actually surprising to me that nowadays we find when people are being given credit, it is the bishops of the Anglican Church uh, and pastors of the Dutch Reformed Church. When it was AME pastors who, who served as advisors to leaders of the, the struggle of South African people, AME churches who opened their doors and was a place of refuge when they ran away from security forces. AME churches who prayed for, for liberation uh, fighters. And most of the people that served that first period of the black government were trained uh, by the AME church at Wilberforce Institute, who is now Wilberforce Community College. And I was uh, privileged to serve as the president of R.R. Wright Theological Seminary, which is on the same campus of the old Wilberforce Institute. So, so I had a great privilege, and God has just been good and placed me in these strategic places where I could give leadership. What do you think Richard Allen would say about the AME Church on the continent of Africa um, today? I serve now as the Bishop of the 17th Episcopal District and the country of Zambia where our headquarters of the 17th Episcopal District just celebrated their Jubilee celebration, the 50th year of existence. I had the privilege to preach for them uh, when they had the countrywide celebration because they said, the liberation fighters who were still alive said, the AME church was the only church that gave them refuge during that time. And so I was so proud to have the privilege to preach that national service that they had. Uh, so I think our founder will be very proud of the AME Church, what it has done throughout uh, Africa and the continent. And we can't stop now. We must move on to even the more incredible future of the church and do even more for the people of color throughout the world. Bishop Messiah, um, can you take us back to your election? Uh, what was that moment like for you? It was an exciting day, very confusing and unexpected. Uh, I was a very comfortable, proud pastor of St. Paul Church in Pittsburgh when the bishops of the church asked me to return to South Africa to serve as the president of our Wright Theological Seminary. Uh, had no idea that the opportunity will present itself for me to become a bishop in the church. Uh, and while serving there, I've, I served the church and uh, uh, Maconi Church, who was named after the founder of African Methodist Episcopal Church in, in, in that area, uh, Southern Africa. And I was president of the seminary. The seminary did so well. We were privileged to have our hands on young men and prepare them for ministry. 
and then the church grew by leaps and bounds. And I think some of the bishops of the church who saw the work that I have done uh, encouraged me to run for the Episcopacy because it was 20 years prior that Bishop Sonatle was elected. And so I threw my hat in the ring, did all the necessary things. I prayed, I talked, and I asked people to support me. And so when the church made a decision to elect three bishops, I prayed that I would be one of the three. And God favored me that I was elected the first among the eight bishops that were elected in 2004. So I was just so outdone. Half of the stuff that happened that night, I can't remember, but I was very pleased that heaven smiled on me and afforded me the privilege to serve the church on a larger scale. That I, I, I really see it as God increasing my territory to have greater import and impact on what happens in the AME church. Our final question, I'm calling this the AME Vault. Um, to go back into your own personal AME vault and think of a memory that makes you smile or makes you laugh, either from your childhood or early pastoral days or first few days as a bishop, something, a memory to share that makes your heart smile. I really like, I had, when I went uh, to South Africa, just before I went, I went back to complete my doctor in ministry at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary because I really felt I needed it. And I had no idea how much what I learned at seminary in my doctor ministry program would help me even in Africa. My ministry was uh, just extremely successful. We had one of the largest HIV AIDS ministries not supported by a government or not supported by a foundation but supported by Maconi African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, people and, and it was a successful. I think that was one of the things that made our church grow. The people there waited for 19 years to build their church and the church grew so that we could build the church in that. And a beautiful church stands in Soweto. It's not in the city of Johannesburg. It is in Soweto, where people said, people at that time, unemployment was 44%. Uh, but God did wonders among us. And uh, things just went well. So. When I think about what God had done, I had a one year, five month old baby. When I got there, I slept on the floor. There was no furniture in the parsonage there in Soweto. But I knew if I'm faithful to what God had called me to, God will always be faithful to me. And, and God did the rest. And yeah, I am today as one of the bishop of this church of whom I'm so proud that I'm looking forward to serve for many years. Thank you, Bishop Messiah. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you for your service. God bless you. Honored to have had this time with you today. Thank you. Thank you kindly. Thank you kindly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the AME exclusive and you can only get it here. Bishop Messiah. The AME exclusive continues with Bishop Vashti Murphy McKenzie. Thank you, Bishop McKenzie, for speaking with us today. Well, thank you for including me. I appreciate it. 
in the midst of our bicentennial here in Philadelphia, how do you feel about our church celebrating 200 years? It is really exciting. After all the kinds of things that could have happened, that could have stopped uh, the vision of Richard Allen, that could have um, just derailed everything, uh, the people just pressed their way and God blessed in such a special way. And so we're able to reflect, especially at this time. It is now 2016. It's 200 years later. And we're still fighting fights that we thought should have ended a long time ago. People's lives are still in danger. You are still fighting for your dignity and the right to vote and the right to speak up and a rightful place in America. Uh, and so uh, not only are we remembering uh, that history, but we're remembering the history of Africans in America who are Americans. Your election, historic, uh, the first woman bishop elected to um, serve in the AME Church. I, like so many women, uh, like so many ministers uh, who are women, um, when you walk into a room, it is just history in motion. It is this, this is our in, impossible becoming possible. Um, how does that resonate with you, knowing the place that you have in the history in total of the AME Church? Well, to tell you quite frankly, I don't think about it every day. It's not like, wow, everything you do, everything you say is going to be, it will have a historical impact. Uh, for me, it is about the work. You know, I was called to preach, called to pastor, called to Episcopal service. And so, you know, I want to, you know, God use me so that the women and the men who are coming behind me will say, yeah, you know, she did the best she could. God blessed uh, that I was able to push the edge a little bit further push the envelope, you know, get down the street a little bit further, um, you know, pave the way a little bit further so that the younger women who are coming along won't, may not have to fight as hard uh, as we did when we were coming along. And so I, I praise God for the first and second wave women. Uh, these are the women who, you know, there was, you, you could only be licensed to preach like Jarena Lee. That's all you could do. So you preached in the bathroom, you preached in the kitchen, you preached on street corners. Uh, you, uh, you know, you, you held your, ex, you know, auxiliary meetings and all of a sudden you were preaching. You know, you pastored unofficially, you know, without recognition, without title, and without ordination. Uh, and so these women paved the way so that I could be here today. So I hope that I can pave the way for the women who are now coming up uh, will be able to um, get down the road a little bit further. Talk about that going down the road, talk about that pushing the envelope. What kind of changes have you seen in the AME Church since your historic election? I, I, I believe that when I announced my candidacy, uh, the questions that, you know, some of the things that people were saying, we're not quite sure a woman can handle this job. We're not quite sure a woman can handle this job. Same kinds of things when, when all of us, you know, women have always been in ministry. It's just the number of women who are in ministry now. And so when that huge wave of women coming into the ministry, going into seminary, getting their degrees, graduating, uh, itinerant elders and eligible and ready and gifted and skilled to be appointed as pastors, when all of that began to happen, what was, I don't think women can pastor a, a church and raise her children and love her husband and take care of her family. We don't think that she can do this. So the same things were when, when I announced my candidacy. We're not quite sure a woman can do it. And then after a little while, I said, well, we're not sure a woman will go to Africa. And then, well, we're not sure, um, you know, she can handle the stress, the strain, the burdens, and the blessings uh, that this ministry requires. And then finally you get to the year 2000, it's like, which woman are we going to elect? Mm -hmm. I'd like to have you um, talk a little bit about the AME Church in terms of where we are um, with this 200 year history, um, balanced with where the rest of the world is and how we can still have an impact that we just don't stop at 200 years, but how we go forward, still moving the vision of Richard Allen forward. I think we are, we are at pause to be in position again to be the conscious of the world, not just America, but to be the conscious of a world. Uh, five continents, uh, 39 countries getting ready to be 40 and 41, uh, we're, we're everywhere. 
and we have the same mandate, the gospel mandate, to preach the pastor. But wherever there's an AME church, there's an education ministry somewhere. Wherever there's an AME church, there's outreach ministry going on. Wherever you see an AME church, we are stewards of the community, taking care of the community, meeting the needs of the community. So we are caretakers of the human spirit, caretakers of the human body, wherever we are. Uh, and so uh, and not only that, we are the voice of liberation. You know, the first civil rights movement happened in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. After the Civil War, the first persons, the first uh, black Americans to be elected to Congress were AME pastors. When, the, you know, the second civil rights movement began, it was an AME pastor out of Topeka, Kansas, Reverend Brown, who was in that suit, uh, Brown versus the Board of Education, uh, that ended uh, separate but equal. So uh, at every juncture where uh, African Americans moved forward in our country, we were there. We were there. Our churches were the places where uh, the civil rights workers met and marched from. So here we are today. Uh, the, the issues may be the same. It may be a new twist. You know, old devils come back in new ways. <laughs> but we have new tools in which to use. You know, now Richard Allen uh, preached from a pulpit without a microphone. Now, the Richard Allens of today, uh, ha we have Twitter and Facebook and technological means of getting our message out. The message is the same. The message of Jesus Christ is the same. But how we move the ministry forward has changed. A personal question in terms of being a bishop of the church, and you have um, four more years um, to, to be a, what we call an active bishop. Um, on your list of things I like to do while I'm serving as a bishop, not that that list exists, it might exist, I don't know, but if you've made a mental list of list of things I like to accomplish while I'm a bishop of the church, um, what do you see happening over the next four years? Uh, what kind of ideas or plans do you have in mind as you approach 2020? Well, you know, I have a habit of trying not to say what it is until it starts to happen, <laughs> until it unfolds, you know. Uh, but uh, for me, um, I believe God has called me to be a change agent. And so wherever um, God places me, whether it's in a pulpit, as a pastorate of a congregation, uh, in the episcopacy, I believe God has called me to be a change agent, to see what is not there and to work hard to get it there, to see what needs to be done and to get it done. And that can take many different shapes and forms. Uh, it's like, what is the need and let's see how we can meet it. So in Texas, Texas is a big state where I serve. You know, how do you bring people who are just spread out all the way from the Texas Panhandle to the Gulf of Mexico, all the way from El Paso, which is right underneath of New Mexico, to Texarkana, which is about as far northeast as you can go in the state of Texas. Uh, how do you uh, get people to, to come together and be together? So we figured out how to use the technology. Uh, and how to keep people together on the same agenda, the same mind. How do we get resources? How do we deliver resources to people who are spread out? And so, you know, okay, God, come on, help us with the vision and the mechanism to do that. Um, our churches uh, who support our connectional church on a regular basis, how do we figure out how to support them in new and creative ways. So uh, we developed a 501c3 nonprofit called 10th Future Inc. 10th Future Inc. is a way of which we raise funds outside of ties and offerings in a creative way by inviting other people other than AMEs to help support our work. And so in the past four years, uh, in the 10th District, we raised $274,000. We have supported uh, 35 churches and 13 students who are studying for the ministry. And so, you know, that's what it's, you know, a change agent. We, we reverse the process. It's usually uh, the people in the local congregations that resource the connectional church. You have individual churches that invest in a larger ministry, colleges and universities and seminaries, missionaries overseas, missionaries at home, uh, local churches who invest in a larger ministry. Uh, and so we change that equation by taking the larger ministry and finding a creative way of how we can resource them. Because if we resource them, they will be able to do a greater ministry in their local uh, in their local community but they'll also be able to do a greater ministry in resourcing the connection I love that I love that uh, I cannot let you leave without mentioning further record that you are the national chaplain 
of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, um, the illustrious sisterhood uh, that we both share. Uh, uh, and I just want to know, how do you balance those two worlds, being the, the national chaplain of such a major organization and being a bishop um, as well, having to, to operate in, in two of those arenas? Or is it all the same, service? Yes, it is. Uh, public service in one area, public service in, a, in, a, in another. Uh, the motivation is still the same. Uh, we serve God by serving others. In one way, you do it in the context of a, of a congregation, a local church, a denomination, and others, you do it in a fellowship or in a sisterhood. Um, I believe the gospel, and the gospel says, go ye therefore, and preach. And then it said, listed a whole lot of things. You start in Jerusalem and you work your way to Samaria. It didn't say just go to those who believe already but it just says it says go and so wherever the venue is wherever the audience is wherever there's a gathering wherever there's a person that is where we are to go ye therefore and teach and preach and tell others what Christ has told us so it doesn't matter whether it's a sisterhood whether it's a community organization uh, whether it's it's a person's home whether it's a church it doesn't matter where it is you know whether it's the brothel whether it's the bar you know wherever it is you know we are to go ye therefore and do uh, because everyone has not heard the gospel everyone ha does not know about Jesus and so we a people of faith cannot keep sitting in our in our citadels our holy hush of citadels and wait for people to say you know I think I want to go to church we have to take the church to the people we have to take the gospel to the people and then invite them in invite them in and create different avenues for people to get there so everybody doesn't come to Christ on Sunday morning that's a good spot good place good time but everybody doesn't make Sunday morning believe non-believers don't wake up on Sunday and say hey I think I want to go to church so you have to encounter them before you get to Sunday and create doors for them to come through to access the gospel in different ways we got to go be imaginative be open be creative and make new ways to bring people to the body of Christ amen I love it the last question I'm calling this the AME vault I'm asking interviewees to go back into their personal AME vaults and find uh, a memory that makes them smile or makes their heart smile, either from your childhood or early pastoral days or early days as a bishop or two months ago. Just a memory that, that makes you smile about the AME church. There's, so, there's too much. We don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> there's too much. Um, there's a whole lot that makes me smile about the African Methodist Episcopal Church and many moments where I'm just, you know, glad to be an AME, so proud of what my church has done and, and, and what we're doing in the community and what we're doing around the world. So there's just so much. But let's see if I can pick just one personal story. Um, I was assigned, uh, Bishop H. Hoffer Brookins assigned me to Payne Memorial AME Church in Baltimore. Um, it, at that time, there were no other women serving uh, in what they would call a connectional church or, or, or you know, a large or assignment. And um, when I went to that congregation, um, uh, a gentleman met me at the door, a senior, a senior man, and he says, well, I'm never going to have you as my pastor. You know, and, you know, I said, okay, you know, praise the Lord. <laughs> and uh, went in and, and went about my duties, you know, preach my sermon, you know, organize, uh, you know, meet my officers. Let's take a look at the budget. Let's take a look at the agenda. What's the calendar about? What kind of ministries do you have? Let's do some visioning and so forth. And let's see uh, how we're going to proceed uh, for this year. Uh, Sunday number one. Second Sunday after I preach, he and his wife came and came up to me before I could even get to the door to shake hands and says, I'm so glad you're my pastor. Oh, the Lord. Oh, you know, beautiful. and so um, if, if hearts and minds can change that way, um, I'm just, it makes you smile and say, well, praise God. Praise God. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for speaking with us. It's an honor to have this time with you, Bishop thank McKenzie. You. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless your ministry as you and your family go forth to serve. Thank you. Pray thank for you. us. Certainly There's still a lot to be done. To be done. <laughs> <laughs> this is the AME exclusive, and you can only get it here. Bishop McKenzie, thank you.